You probably have seen warnings, warning labels on, on products and things. And usually it's because somebody misused that product and now they've issued a warning about it. Uh, I, I found a couple of warnings I thought were really interesting. Uh, shin pads cannot protect any part of the body they do not cover. <laughs> I don't know what someone was thinking, but here's one warning. Do not spray in eyes. That's on a container of underarm deodorant. <laughs> Maybe they thought they were going to keep themselves from crying. I don't know. <laughs> Warning, do not iron clothes on body. <laughs> now that is efficient, but yeah. Warning, product will be hot after heating. Yeah. Warning, remove occupants from the stroller before folding it. <laughs> now, there's some parents that might be tempted. Hmm, yeah. A lot of those warnings are about the misuse of something, and Jesus actually enters into a series of warnings, now seven of them, and they're basically about seven ways religion and faith can be misused. The challenging thing is, while the last ones we just read were humorous, the warnings Jesus gives are actually not so humorous, and they're based on the same concept. Religion and faith can be horribly misused. That people who start with a passion for God can wind up going someplace else, and it's quite remarkably different than what they intended, and it has a remarkably negative effect on our world. And so, in this passage, while Jesus talks about the Pharisees and other religious leaders a lot. In the first verse of chapter 23, we know that he's talking to his disciples and to the crowd. And so in just a few days, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be tried, he's going to be crucified. And right now he's trying to make use of every single minute that he has available to him to teach us some very important truths. And the word he uses to start his warning is the word woe. And the word woe means sorrow or distress. He's kind of saying, if you go down this road, there's nothing but sorrow and distress waiting for you. So he's warning his listeners. He's warning his followers. And what he's telling us is, it, it, this is really interesting. We all kind of know that there are sins we're tempted by and susceptible to when we're not interested in God. But Jesus wants us to know that there's actually some sins that we're tempted by and susceptible to when we are interested in God. This is a really intriguing thing. And by the way, the language is going to be a little bit challenging. It, it might make you uncomfortable. But Jesus wants to warn us. And once again, not as, not as funny as the ones that I read earlier, but uh, these are very, very powerful. So let's begin in Matthew uh, chapter 23, verse 13. Woe, so here's the warning. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. I'll come back to that word in just a minute. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter are trying to. Now, the word hypocrites is actually the word in Greek used for an actor. Back in those days, they didn't just act a part, they would wear a mask so that you knew they were acting a part. And Jesus is saying there are people who are playing a part, they're acting. It's not the real them, it's some other version that they're pretending to be. And he says, this is a real risk when we come to pursuing religious life. There's what we want to be, but wanting to be something and trying to grow in that area is not the same thing as pretending to be. He says, so, so he gives a warning. And, and it's easy to limit the, the idea of, of hypocrite as though it's, it's someone who says one thing and does another, right? We all know that's hypocritical, to say one thing and do another. But it can also be used for people who firmly believe a thing and they pursue it so strongly that they actually wind up doing things that they know are wrong, but they believe they have an excuse for them because they're so passionate about this. So the first warning is a warning about keeping others out. Keeping others out. One time I, I asked for a group of volunteers from uh, our, our audience to, to come up to the front of the room. 
and I asked them to form a circle. And then I asked one more person to come up. And I asked that person, I, I told them, I said, your job, no matter what, is to get into the middle of that circle. When I count three, that's your job. And so I counted three, and instantly, every one of those people in the circle locked arms and tried to keep him out. I never asked them to do that. I just told one person it was their job to get in, and everyone else assumed it was their job to keep him out. Something's built into the human psyche that, that we don't completely understand. When we huddle up, I wonder who we're hiding from. That could be a real thing. So the, the Pharisees and the, the teachers of the law, they were losing some of their standing with Jesus. Jesus was wildly popular and people were following him. And, and, and it was one thing for them to decide, you know, I'm, I'm not really interested in following this guy. I, I don't agree or subscribe to the things that he says. But they didn't just stop there. They actually wanted to make sure that other people didn't follow Jesus. And eventually, they are going to arrange for his, his arrest and his crucifixion. They won't enter God's kingdom, but that's not enough for them. They use their influence to keep others from entering. They would attack the leader. By the way, in case you think that that doesn't happen today, it absolutely does, but a little more nuanced. Uh, we, we can find all kinds of channels on social media that, that basically attack other religious leaders because there's some nuance of something that they like or don't like that we don't agree with. And some people feel very righteous in calling attention to that and warning anybody, don't pay any attention to these people. And it's a, it's a really risky thing. Then he goes on to this, whoa, here's another warning. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you are. How many know that's not complimentary language, right? Uh, what's the warning here? It's a warning about missional confusion. Missional confusion. There's a strong temptation to get people to join our cause, not just to join in faith. It's something that we're, we're tempted by. We can get real focused on numbers. There are, it's very easy in church world to justify your strategies, your doctrine, everything based on how many people show up on a Sunday. 25 years ago, there were less than 20 people. Less than 20. Imagine if I allowed numbers to determine whether I had valid ministry or our church was called by God to be part of our community. See, we have to be very cautious about this. People can, can, can become focused on, on converting people not to Jesus and not to faith, but to certain kinds of traditions and culture and regulations. I watched a missionary one time many years ago who proved that people were coming to Christ in a faraway third world nation that he was uh, uh, ministering in because now they were dressing like Americans. Is that really what Jesus came to do? I mean, Jesus, I don't know how to break it to this guy, but Jesus didn't dress like an American. There, there are, have been times when mission efforts in, in Christianity have actually been more about culture and tradition and preference than it's been about faith and grace and truth. And, and if we get more concerned about how a building looks or what a song sounds like, uh, what's acceptable to God, we're going to mess things up royally. And Jesus is warning us about this. There can, this can be a serious temptation for us because we found things that we like and we think makes life work better. And so our goal is to help others experience that, but sometimes we turn to wanting to impose that, and we recruit people to our preferences rather than to a passion for Jesus. Jesus says, be, you, you have to be warned about that. That's a real thing. And then continuing on in verse 16, woe to you, another warning, woe to you, blind guys. You say if, guides, not blind guys. <laughs> Uh, you say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears 
by the gold of the temple is bound to that oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? Or you also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift on the altar that, or what makes the gift sacred? Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar or swears by it, and uh, let me do that again. Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. This is a warning about how we use our language. See, do you remember as a child, I don't know if they still do this anymore, but when we were kids, we thought that if we made a promise and our fingers were crossed behind our back, that the promise didn't count. Does it, did anybody do anything like that? How many are, are not raising your hand, but you're crossing your fingers right now? I, I think I know who you are. So uh, the idea was that there was something that negated the words that I just spoke, even if you were unaware of it. And, and they come up with this. When you think of it, it sounds really childish, right? You, you can swear by the temple. That doesn't count. But if you swear by the gold on the temple, oh, oh, oh that's it. Now you're, now you're caught. And Jesus had some very strong words to say about that. And what he, what he used the word over and over again in that passage is blind. You think you see a loophole, but you're actually blind to something that's very, very powerful and true. And Jesus is asking, well, what do you think makes something valuable to begin with? And you're talking about the gold, maybe because you're attracted to gold. And you're talking about the gifts, maybe because you're attracted to gifts. But the truth is, is that you're finding a way to not keep your word. Jesus had strong views about making oaths to begin with. In Matthew chapter 5, he says this, Again, you have heard it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot even make one hair black, white or black, I know we have options on that now. Back then they didn't. Yeah. All you need to do, all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. What are people doing when they, when they say that? They're trying to, they want other people to have the impression they're taking this really seriously. And Jesus says, why don't you just live your life in such a way and talk in such a way that people can always believe what you say? And sometimes we want to make bold promises in front of other people. Well, how do you increase the boldness of the promise? Maybe you bring something spiritual into it. So as God is my witness, right? and, and Jesus says that as entering into an area where, where you are, you are saying, if I say these words, it counts. If I say these words, maybe they don't count. And, and there's an element here that goes beyond just looking for loopholes. There's an element here where you're trying to manage the impressions of other people because you're making a bold promise or, or even this. There's an element of superstition involved here. Because if I say these words in this way, then maybe not only am I making a promise, maybe I'm also obligating God to help me keep that promise. And Jesus warns us about that. He said, that's not a good way to go. Then verse 23, it says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat. Gnats were considered uh, unclean. And so when they would pour their wine, they would filter it to make sure that no, no gnat was in there and they would accidentally, he said, but then you turn around and swallow a camel. This is a warning about neglecting what really matters. Focusing on small things can easily give an impression that you take everything very seriously. I was aware of a pastor one time who used to regularly tell stories that if he used the church copier for something personal, he would go to the secretary and, and reimburse the church the amount of money for that copy. 
And, and he, he would tell us that that's a really important sign of integrity. And yet he was living through a significant moral failure in his life. What, what is he doing? He's focusing on the small things, almost as a distraction. And Jesus warns us about that. So Jesus tells us that we have to pay attention, that, that uh, not just look for ways to distract people. Jesus, is being, Jesus says being faithful in your tithes and being faithful in your offerings doesn't exempt you from more important things, things like justice and mercy and faithfulness. And here's the thing about justice and mercy and faithfulness. They are complicated. Tithes are simple, 10%. Do the math, not hard. Justice, what's that? Well, it's, it's equity, it's, it's fairness, it's, it, it's doing what is right. And if you've lived very long, you know sometimes it's hard to know what is the right thing to do. It's hard to do that. And it's so easy, especially in our culture where everyone has a megaphone on social media to decry someone or some organization because they've acted unjustly. But the question is, when we have an opportunity to treat someone fairly and equitably, do we do that at an individual level? And it becomes complicated, right? What's the right thing to do? If I help this person, maybe it could go this way, maybe it could go that way, and I don't know what to do. So it's complicated, but it doesn't just stop there. Mercy is also complicated because let's suppose that the person who's been unjust is being called into account. If a person has acted with injustice, are we supposed to show mercy to them? If we do, isn't that just letting them get away with their injustice? And then we start thinking thoughts like this. Well, mercy is just for the people who deserve it, which is <laughs> mercy is exactly for people who don't deserve it. That's what makes it mercy. It's complicated. And then faithful, faithfulness. What is that? To be full of faith. What does that mean? It means that you actually trust God with your life. You trust God. Like he's given us guidelines and commands. And so many times we worry that if I live by that, I will be missing out on something else. And what God wants to do is to help our lives flourish. But we are told by so many people that that's limiting us in some way. And so we find ourselves taking a step back. And what Jesus says is, is that you can pay really close attention to the small things, but that doesn't exempt you from the bigger things. Justice, mercy faithfulness. Then in verse 25, woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup of the dish and inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup of the dish and then the outside will also be clean. This is a warning about focusing on appearance. Have you ever been in a restaurant and you had a cup and there was still something in it? Have you ever had a, a, a piece of silverware and there was still some crusted food on there from, from someone else that was eating in that very same place? And what do you think? Do you think, oh, a bonus. <laughs> I didn't have to pay for that and I get it anyway. This is wonderful. That's not what you think. You usually, you usually uh, ask the waitress if you could have a, a different bowl or cup, right? Because because it doesn't matter how clean it looks on the outside, if there's decaying food on the inside, it's not good. And, and Jesus says that when we focus on the outside and just our appearance, we actually don't deal with what is decaying on the inside of us. And this is a problem. And decaying food isn't good for us or anyone else. He says on the inside, you, on the outside you look good, on the inside you're full of greed. Greed has to do with any kind of economic sin. And, and full of self-indulgence. You're, you're looking for things that please you. And uh, we can be shocked when a religious person fails morally. And that's because we've been looking at the outside. When we, look, when we pay attention to the inside, that's where transformation actually occurs. When we focus on the outside, it's easy to become very indifferent and it's easy to make excuses. Focus on the interior life. What does that have to do with? It has to do with things like attitudes. How many here always has a great attitude? Right. None of us. None of us. Assumptions. How many always make the right assumptions? 
And not just about other people. Sometimes we assume things about ourselves. I shouldn't have to wait. I'm worth more. I should get something else. I don't have to put up with this. We have a whole set of assumptions and we let those things go. We never deal with attitudes and we never deal with assumptions. But when we walk into places, we look good. Just tell the person next to you right now, you look good. You do. You look good. If it's not your wife or your husband, don't, don't, don't say that. I should have said that first, shouldn't I? Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of the bones of de the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but in the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. This is a warning about separation. Uh, there were pilgrimages that people would make to Jerusalem, and when people came, they didn't want to become unclean as they went along the way. And if you came in contact with a grave, you were considered unclean. And so they would take whitewash, kind of like a white paint, and they put it over the graves. They weren't as neatly ordered or obvious as they are in our cemeteries today. And so they would put whitewash on them, and that way when you were coming to Jerusalem, you could easily avoid them. And Jesus said there's something going on like that with the religious leadership of, of his day. He says you're, you're whitewashing in order to avoid, but the message you're sending is you don't want to be contaminated by other people, and you're the one who's actually contaminated with death. And, and it's, it's a problem. Uh, one of the most powerful testimonies that I heard was of a young woman who had uh, won an award in the music industry, and they and and it was her first award, and uh, and she was going. I mean, it was just quite a remarkable accomplishment. And they asked her about going to the award ceremony, and she said, "I'm I'm not going to be able to go." And they asked her why, and she says, "Well, she says uh, I've recently discovered some things about myself." And what I've discovered is that when I'm around certain kinds of temptations, I have weaknesses towards those, and I don't do that very well. She says, I fall into things that have been so destructive for me, instructive, destructive to the people that I love. And she said, it's, it's just not good that I go to that because I know I'll be surrounded by the kinds of things that, that I could just fall apart in. And so I'm going to stay away. And I thought it was such a brilliant thing because what she could have said is this. What she could have said is, I recently came to faith in Christ and I'm not going to hang around that kind of filth anymore. That's not what she said. She said, I know what my weaknesses are. I know what my temptations are. And if I'm around that, it won't be their fault that I fall. It'll be because I put myself in that position and I need to be more cautious than that. She, she demonstrated humility. She acknowledged her weakness. And that's how you experience real life. When you pay attention to the inside like that, that's how real transformation occurs. It doesn't happen super fast, but it happens. And then he says this in the 29th verse. Now ask the worship team to come out. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding of blood or of the, pro of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then and complete what your ancestors started. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? This is a warning against self-righteousness. This group of people uh, uh, built tombs over the sites of where previous prophets that had been killed for speaking God's word by their ancestors. And this is what they told everybody and themselves. If I had lived then, I would not have done that. I would have listened. I would have learned. I would have benefited from that. And here's what we need to know. That's a form of self-righteousness. We all sit in, in, in the world in which we live today, and I, don't get me wrong, I would rather have lived today than 100, 200, or 500 years ago. How many are glad we live now and not them? Yeah, I mean, just uh, uh, if, if you want to get from here to there, I can do it at 65 miles an hour if I'm driving, and I, I, I don't how fast do planes go? Really fast if I'm flying. And, and we go, oh, that's wonderful. I, I can get medical care that wasn't available long ago. But it's so easy to look at the sins of our forefathers and say we would have done it different. That is the most dangerous kind of self-righteousness. 
Because social science has proved beyond any reasonable doubt, we would not have done different and we might have been worse. This idea that if I were alive then, I would have honored what God was doing. These same people that were building temples for previous generations of prophets were also arranging for the death and burial of Jesus. They didn't want him around. How do we handle the prophetic moments in our own lives right now? When God is trying to whisper something to us, when God is trying to direct us, when God is trying to help us grow in a particular area, how do we listen to the promptings of God's word to us right now? Even when it challenges us, do we easily dismiss it? How much do we make ourselves available to the prayers of others so that they can bring the presence of God into our lives with them and support us in intercession with the things that we're struggling with? And it's so easy to go, yeah, if I lived back then, I would never. Anytime I hear the word, I would never, that makes me the most anxious of all because I have come to discover that people who say that are the ones who are most susceptible to doing even worse. And Jesus warns us. He warns us. Not because he's frustrated by what he's seeing, because he's on a rescue mission. He wants to restore. He wants to redeem. He wants to recover what has been broken. And what he's saying is, we carry the grace and the truth of God. Don't fall into the kinds of traps that are going to make us susceptible to pushing people away from God or keeping ourselves away. Don't do that. Live your faith out in such a way that when people see the grace of God in your life, they're attracted to that too. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for warning us. You don't want us to go down a road that we could be injured. You don't want us to go down a road where we would cause your name to be considered poorly in our world. You want us to go down roads that lead to life. We thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.